Okay, you can hear me okay though, right? Yes. Sometimes my mic doesn't record very loud. But anyways, um, please welcome the incredible Anna Dearman Kornick. Hi, Renee. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, uh, thanks for joining me. I was actually just looking at some of your Instagram stories and how I'd love to be in your house for Mardi Gras. <laughs> oh my goodness. So <laughs> yes, I live right above New Orleans and Mardi Gras is everything for a few weeks here in the spring. And uh, today's actually Ash Wednesday, so as we're recording. And yesterday was Fat Tuesday. And that's why yes. we ate Popeyes, right? Yeah, that's why we ate Popeyes. You're exactly right. Um, and so it's just a really fun time with parades and families getting together. It's like a a, a week long tailgate in a way. So, but yeah, it's I really fun. You'll have wish. to come down. <laughs> I know. I've been to New Orleans once for a friend's birthday, mm -hmm. and we had so much fun. Yeah. Um, but we don't really celebrate Mardi Gras up here in Canada. I feel mm. like it's. It, we should. We had family day on Monday, which was a very low-key version of not Mardi Gras. Right. <laughs> but I could use some colors and feathers and beads in my life. Definitely. Everybody needs a little bit of glitter. Yeah, it's so funny because most people equate New Year's Day with being, okay, this is fresh start. This is the beginning of the year. And then things are just kind of boring for a little while. You know, spring gets slow. But down here in Louisiana, 12 days or 12 days after Christmas is when um, the Mardi Gras season kicks off. And so right after New Year, we go straight into the Mardi Gras season all the way up until Mardi Gras Day. And then it's almost like this is the reset button. This is when everybody starts saying, OK, I've spent the last month eating nothing but king cake and fried chicken. It's time to work on the diet. It's time to start working out again. It's like our second New Year. Okay, I would, I would, that would be not be good for me at all. So there's no dry January then in Louisiana. This mm, doesn't happen. No, <laughs> not, not really. I mean, sure, but. Yeah, not really. <laughs> yeah. If you choose to. Um, so cool. I love that. Thanks for the little culture update. So let's start off with some quick questions, of which we probably answered one, but where are you from? Yeah, so I am from Louisiana, and I've lived in a lot of different places around Louisiana. I grew up in North Louisiana in the piney hills of the state and went to LSU in Baton Rouge, go Tigers, and lived in New Orleans for a while, and now we live about an hour above New Orleans, and I love it. There's nowhere like Louisiana. I, yeah, I do love it too. There's so much culture. I love the jazz scene down there. <laughs> yes, really fun. <laughs> and the food and the people. I, oh I my gosh. I was by myself. I went to this like jazz club that someone suggested I go to. This was like, I got to New Orleans a day or two early mm -hmm. before all the other girls were showing up for my friend's birthday. And it's like, I've, I'm, if I'm going to travel this far, I'm going to go and I'm going to spend some time there. And I just went to this jazz club. I don't know where it was. Was it Preservation Hall? Hall? I don't even remember. <laughs> I just remember what it looked like. And I walked yeah. in there. I was like, oh my gosh, everyone seems to know each other here. And I found this one stool at the bar and I went and I sat at it and I was like, I'm just going to sit here and have some snacks and have a drink. And people were so nice mm -hmm. around me. They're like, where are you from? Oh my God, Canada? I'm like, yeah, it's not that <laughs> far away. Um, but it was such a cool, a cool experience. And I highly recommend that to be on everyone's travel destination in the near future. Yes, come on before, down. Before it sinks. <laughs> yes, yes, There's please. There's actually um, a Canadian band. Um, why is their name escaping me? But if you're Canadian, you know what I'm going to sing right now is um, there's a, a line in one of the songs called New Orleans is Sinking. Yes. And I don't want to swim. Oh. <laughs> or something like that. I probably just yeah. it. But anyways, I will not sing the actual song for you. Okay, <laughs> I would love to know what was one of the toughest moments you had to face as an entrepreneur? Goodness. So what comes to mind immediately for me was trying to come back from maternity leave after my second daughter was born. The transition from one kid, from one child to two, having a two-year-old and a newborn at home is stressful in and of itself. Just navigating the uh, ugh, tenacious twos, terrible twos, ridiculous twos alongside a newborn. And I love my work. I love my work and the legacy aspect of it and serving other women and restarting or, or getting back into work 
after having my second child was so hard, not because I didn't want to work. That was the problem. Like I desperately wanted to get back into my work, but balancing motherhood and business, that was the first time that I really felt like I had to make sure my time management was as on as possible so that I was showing up for my girls and beginning to lay the foundation to come back after my business. And you know, you feel torn in a lot of different directions because you wanna be there for your family, you want to start working again, you're navigating childcare. This was still in, um, I mean, childcare was still hard to come by at the time and it just felt like being pulled in every direction. But it was, I think a really important um, just muddy, murky, messy period to walk through because so many other women experience the same thing. And it helped me figure out, okay, how do I problem solve through this? How do I navigate these feelings, but also service to my business and my clients while still showing up as my best self? Yeah, I, I get that feeling of being torn totally. So my story is that I had both my boys and they're 11 months apart. So in the same year starting in my business, I also had my two kids. Mm. Um, and when you're kind of a naive first time mother, you're like, oh, babies, I just heard they sleep all the time. So <laughs> let's just start a business and that's fine. They'll be sleeping in the corner, which yes, there were some moments where this happened where you could bring your cute little nugget in the car seat into the office and put them mm -hmm. in the corner, but you're exhausted because they were awake all night exactly. the night before. And then it was so unpredictable for months. Uh, but we, we eventually navigated it. And it's, it's the interesting thing is like, maybe our generation actually started talking about this mm -hmm. stuff a little bit more and us feeling more validated because we're talking about how nuanced and complicated and exhausting it is to be a mother and the shame around like all of the things. And we're finally opening up this dialogue. Yeah. We and find like, out that we're not alone. Yeah. And we're not well, we're all crazy together. Yes. <laughs> it's like a big party of craziness. Yeah. A bunch of sleep deprived, crazy people. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. That's totally <laughs> um, well, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think I have the same story too. Is mm -hmm. that because like that, the pull between do I work in my business, which actually makes me really, really happy and I mm -hmm. love doing what I do, or do I get called into being the mother, the parent that I need to be? And like both are valid. There's no shame mm -hmm. in either. Right. Uh, okay. So what is one of your favorite quotes? <laughs> okay. This has been my favorite quote since I discovered it when I was in about fifth grade and it stuck with me for that long. It's an Albert Einstein quote and it's imagination is more important than knowledge. Imagination is more important than knowledge. And I, I love it because I, it, it, almost like a permission to slip, to give in to your creativity and whimsy and to follow the rabbit holes and to um, just embrace problem solving through creativity. And it's really true because if we rely only on what we know and we prioritize what we know, we are completely missing out on everything that could be if we were to throw our imagination into the mix. Totally. I, the first thing that comes to my mind is Disney, right? Imagination. <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing too, is like imagination is a form of knowledge mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's imagination is creating that knowledge. Yeah. And it's also allowing you to be a child again and play. Mm -hmm. Like let's just imagine for a moment that we were on a yacht in the Mediterranean talking about business. Hey, let's yes. go, <laughs> Anna, let's go record our next episode on a yacht in the middle of the Mediterranean. I'm there. Right? <laughs> And you're just like, sit I think today's actually National Margarita Day. We, we could be sipping on margaritas. And Even better. Maybe ordering Popeye's by helicopter. On yes. Popeye. Yes. Just drop it down in a little basket and we'll be good. But I mean, it's so true. Without a baseline of knowledge, that baseline of knowledge is almost like the kindling that gets the fire started. And then you stoke it with other ideas and collaboration with others and learning more and you're able to grow it into something even bigger. I mean, everything notable that's around us from the, the corporations that we, that, that 
you know, Walmart started as an idea, you know, McDonald's started as an idea. This podcast started as an idea and all of these amazing things exist because of imagination. Yeah, I love it. Okay, let's just imagine for a moment the question I have for you <laughs> is what inspired you to start your company? Oh, oh my goodness. Well, you know, what is it? Your mess becomes your mission. Your test becomes your testimony, whatever it is that people say. I used to be a time management mess. Um, I, I think that a lot of people who meet me now assume that I was just born as this amazing time management unicorn that's always operated with itineraries and schedules. But that is actually not the case at all. Um, I used to be the late friend among my group, the one that they would say, oh yeah, dinner's at, at six, or no, dinner's at 5.30, so I would show up by six, or, you know, we're leaving at this time, so I would show up late, but actually on time. You know, it's embarrassing after a while to be that friend, to show up late to someone else's brunch. Um, not to mention that when I was working, so I spent 10 years as a crisis communications, um, crisis communications and governmental affairs professional wow. working 24 seven, always on. And during a six month period at a boutique PR firm that I worked at in New Orleans, I was late no less than 17 times and got written up by my supervisor for being chronically late. So when I tell you that everything has come from experiencing the frantic feeling of running late for a meeting for from feeling just completely overwhelmed and experiencing burnout. I mean, 10 years in crisis communications, serving clients when they're in their darkest times, having to be ready for a phone call to come through at any moment. I was, sh I had a little shelf next to my shower that I would put my phone on just in case. Wow. Um, I got a phone call or blackberries back in the day, just in case I got a blackberry message from my boss. I mean, that was waterproof back then. <laughs> no, they weren't. It was, I just had it like right next to my shower, a little shelf, my blackberry shelf. So I could look at it. It was insane. And so I, wait, wait how many times was there actually a crisis when you were in the shower? I can think of two offhand. Oh, okay. So it really did happen. Yeah, it really did happen. Um, I mean, we're talking like. Things like oil spills and plant explosions and hurricanes and droughts. Um, I worked for Louisiana state government for a period of time uh, in a number of different agencies. And so, oh my gosh, there was this one time that a state owned apartment building was like infested with disgusting things. And that was a shower call. Like the news has called the housing corporation that has called the housing department. We need to write a statement. I'm like, Oh my dear Lord. So that, um, that, so that was like something that <laughs> needed to happen in that moment. It couldn't wait two minutes or five minutes. It, it, <laughs> what's really funny is that the people who are making the phone calls always need everything happen to happen exactly in that moment. Because that's what they got used to, is yes. having people like you be available all the time. And really, in hindsight, it wouldn't have changed anything to finish your shower and then... <sighs> Probably not. No. Wow. Um, although I did have one boss who, if he sent me an email, he made it very clear. When I send you an email, if you do not respond within five minutes with a minimum of, okay, got it, you will be getting a phone call. Oh. Imagine living, knowing that an email could come through at any moment and that you had to be ready to respond within five minutes. I would How often would you check your phone? Every second and I'm anxious too, refreshing, refreshing, and like, oh, worried that something's going to come through and now, you miss it. Or imagine that, years you, of that. <laughs> you live your life and, oh, you're going to the Sunday movies with your husband and, oh, you didn't turn on your phone and there's a crisis. Yeah. So you could be fired from your job. I, or get a very stern talking to and then relocated to That's another disgusting. department. Oh, so then this, <laughs> this mess became your message for your business. Well, I just knew that after one too many mornings, just 
breaking down, crying in my car in the parking lot. I was like, what am I doing? Like at this point, I had missed baby showers for friends. I missed like my stepdad's 70th birthday party. I mean, that's a big deal. You only get one of those. And I had to miss that for a work event that was required. And I was missing fun things on weekends. So many fun things happened in New Orleans and I can still very clearly picture my boyfriend, my husband now leaving with everyone to head out to a festival and I had to stay back because one of my clients was spiraling and in crisis mode and wanted to redo all the messaging. And the company that I worked for, you know, whenever you wanna take off during a work a work day, you ask off, right? You say, I need to be off on Tuesday afternoon to go to an appointment. But there's no process for taking off on the weekends because you're just supposed to be off on the weekends, right? Um, and so I was just kind of left high and dry and had to to get it done. So needless to say, I knew that this this is not the life that I want to live. I don't know what I want my work to look like, but this is not it. And so a week before my husband and I got married, I walked away, quit, um, and decided that I would figure out what was next. You know, it's really funny. I actually read an Instagram post recently about rage quitting. Have you ever rage quit? Like you're furious and you just throw it, throw yeah, in the man, towel I, and walk I away. I quit parenting every single day, <laughs> but then I come back home and they're still there. <laughs> right. Well, I didn't rage quit, but I rage filed an LLC from, oh. <laughs> from my office at this job that I hated. I was so mad. The internet was like messing up and nobody believed me that my internet wasn't working and people were interrupting me constantly. So I like slammed my stuff, slammed my bag down on my desk, opened up my laptop and filed for an LLC in that moment. I called it ADK Strategies. I had no idea what kind of strategies. Oh, sorry, Joel, my my (laughs) podcast editor. No, no, Uh, just you're banging on the. Oh, sorry. coming, (laughs) Coming up on the mic. I'm so sorry. No worries. Joel's really good. He'll take it up. Joel, thank you. Joel, sorry. I was getting really like into it. I all like I can like kind of like ish start over. I'll just say that you I filed. Yeah, I I walked up to my desk. I threw my bag down, opened my laptop, and literally applied for an LLC from the Secretary of State's office online, called it ADK Strategies, had no idea what the strategies were going to be, (laughs) but I knew that I was going to start a business and have my own like time freedom. And so I kind of dove into this period of trial and error and started reading everything that I could get my hands on about time management and productivity and work and business and goals and ideas and gradually it just all started to come together and I decided that it would be my mission to help women either pull themselves out of the dark place of burnout that I had been in or help them avoid it altogether even better (laughs) so that's hilarious I think of like rage quitting I've never heard of somebody rage filing for an LLC um (laughs) I think of these moments where it's like you want to start eating really well because it's just happened in our house where even with my oldest son who wants to get fit to be a better basketball player mm-hmm. and I was like hey let's start with what we eat and he's like that's where it starts yes so we yes. rage emptied our cupboards uh-huh yes and like we're so used to this habit of going in and getting something sweet or a little snack and now we're panicking in the pantry because we don't have those snacks anymore mm-hmm. Like, what do we do? <laughs> I know. What do we do? Oh my gosh. Um, so when you filed for this LLC, this did you quit? You quit at the same time, right? I quit pro- a few weeks later. Okay. I didn't automatically, I didn't automatically walk away in that moment, but I filed the LLC, wasn't sure what I was going to do with it. And I actually tried to, I tried to convince my employer at the time to make me a contract employee. You know, I was like, maybe I can use the LLC this way. Um, or I would give them my two weeks notice (laughs) and they decided to accept my two week notice instead. And I was like, yes, that works. That works for me. Perfect. Yeah. They they made the decision. It wasn't you. It was, yeah, it was either I, I will do this or I will leave. 
And it was so, it was such an empowering moment because it was one of the first times that I really had taken control. And after so many years of just being at the beck and call of my bosses and clients, and I said, this is what I am willing to do, or I am happy to open this position up for someone else. And I walked down to, there was a gift shop underneath the, the building. I walked down to the gift shop and bought this gorgeous, um, Pelican bracelet. Okay. State bird of Louisiana is the brown pelican, but it was this like gorgeous pelican bracelet. And it was just, it made me feel so just empowered and strong. And every time I wear that bracelet, I think back to that day that I said, I will do this or I will leave. And it just, it was such a, a turning point for me. I can imagine. So like that, that option of like giving your boss the, I wit or I and like realistically did you really want them to hire you back as a contractor no <laughs> no so you got what you wanted I did I mean it, it it enabled me to have the freedom to say okay what am I going to do next I knew that the job could be done not in that windowless office that I was working in mm -hmm. I wanted the location freedom I wanted the time freedom and they were not interested in that. And that was perfectly fine with me because I knew I could find that somewhere else. Wow, so now you don't bring your phone into the shower, I'm assuming. I, I do not. <laughs> I, I admit I'd, I've never done it before. Yeah, I've never, I but would I, not recommend it. <laughs> no, I chronically lose my phone now all the time and my kids will call me. And, and I feel like part of it is because I don't want to have that access to mm -hmm. it. So I have subconsciously put it down somewhere that is a safe place, but right. is a forgotten place. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I seriously, I endorse that. That's great. We don't need to be connected twenty four seven. Oh my gosh, and like, let's just let's just rip on this for a second because my anxiety level goes down the less time I'm on my phone. Yeah, and nothing mm -hmm. in my life changes. The revenue in my business might grow actually. Mm -hmm. um, the work I do for my clients is still world class. Mm -hmm. Nothing changes if I'm on my phone more. It yeah. actually gives me more anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like it's like those little dopamine hits of oh somebody liked my post, somebody made a comment. And here's the thing: is like what's worse is when you get those like Debbie Downers and the trolls coming in, mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. comments. It's, it's like worst. what's the cost benefit here? what's the benefit of me scrolling TikTok until my eyes cross before I fall asleep? Oh, but you know what? They have this, <laughs> there's this vortex with TikTok though. You only go on for 15 minutes. It always lasts two hours. Something mm -hmm. happens. Yeah. I don't know. I've deleted it from my phone until my client, who's a top journalist, was giving me some points mm -hmm. on how to do better PR. And she's like, you need to get on TikTok to find the memes to news jack off those memes. <sighs> And I'm like, oh no, I cannot download TikTok on my phone again. Sure enough, it happened. And I finally, yeah. and it's just, it's a smart way of showing you the content that you go down the rabbit hole on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I went on this like dog nutrition, like because we got a new puppy and I are trying to feed it like raw food and we're trying to find the right recipes. And I just started, now all of a sudden, like everything I see is about raw food dog diet. I'm like, <laughs> I don't care anymore. <laughs> right. There's more to my personality than raw, than raw food, food, dog yeah. diets. Come on, TikTok. So that's so interesting though. So now you don't bring your phone into your shower and now you started this company <laughs> teaching women not to do what you've done. Yes. It's amazing. That is right. Yes. <laughs> so tell us, what is some of the most common time management challenges you see amongst women? Sure. I'd say that the, f the first thing that comes to mind is that when someone recognizes I have time management problems, they start looking for a new planner or a tool or some kind of thing that they can buy that will fix the problem. Or if they have a Google calendar, they want to know how, help me figure out how to fit it all in. How do I find time for everything that I'm doing? When I wholeheartedly believe that time management, good time management does not start on the pages of your planner or on your digital calendar. It actually starts from the inside out. And that big mistake is trying to 
fix what's on the surface level, putting a Band-Aid on the fact that you have entirely too many things on your plate because you've said yes to entirely too many things because you haven't gotten clear on how you actually want to live your life and spend your time. There's this awesome quote by Annie Dillard that goes, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. And so often we get caught up in the day to day. How do I make it to the end of my to-do list today? How do I make it to Friday to get to the weekend? How do I get through this Monday? But the thing is, is that all of those days add up to how we spend our entire lives. And so what I always do with my clients is have them start with a vision. You know, what do you want your life to look like a year from now? What do you want to, what stories do you want to tell your family and your friends when you're 80 years old looking back on your life? Do you want to look back on just a blur of meetings and running from one obligation to the next that you had no passion for? Or do you want to look back on a life that was lived with purpose and experiences that actually made you feel something and relationships that were cultivated and nourished over time? So it all starts with vision and knowing what you want before you try to rearrange your calendar. Yeah, so I have a thing called the Morning Practice Planner, and the first part of it is all about this work, setting your goals for the year, creating mission statements, your core values, because when you, just like what you said, when you're clear on what it is you want to do in the day, the week, the quarter, the year, then everything you do, what you focus on, should be contributing to that goal. Mm -hmm. So nowadays my filter is like is that just a shiny object is this mm -hmm. just a distraction because there's yeah. so many great opportunities that come our way to speak at events to go and travel do these things to create stuff and you really have to stop for a second and be like is this a distraction mm -hmm. because it, the it for us it's like the more you do the more you feel like you're accomplishing but if you do oh, yeah. too many things you're spread too thin and everything is done half ass mm -hmm. nothing's done great no so think of like the greats in the world like Danielle Laporte, Marie Forleo, Amy Porterfield, these are people I admire. They've been offering the same thing for years. Yeah. And they refine it and they make it better and they make it mm -hmm. better. They don't mm -hmm. really navigate too much off of that goal because it's like that one focus, right? There's even a book called The One Thing. Yes. Oh my gosh. The One Thing is one of, like, that is one of my favorite books. Like, that's the first personal development book that I recommend to anyone who's getting into it. But hey, on the subject of people going all in on what they're good at, I mean, Mariah Carey has one big Christmas song, I right? <laughs> she ha she doesn't come out with a new Christmas song every year. She goes all in on that one. Okay, year. now it's gonna be stuck in her head. <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean, queen of yeah. repurposing, right? <laughs> That's true, if, you've got, if you're good at that one thing, just own it. Yeah. So I love that it's like, and when you get clear on that, and like the problem with a lot of people too is they're just not clear on what they want. Absolutely. And That's so why people. There's stories in their head yes. saying, oh, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. You're a mother. You shouldn't be working. All these things, right? Mm -hmm. So you help mm -hmm. women get yes. through all that. Right? Yes. Really go, a lot of times it's, it's going from being stuck. I don't know what I want to do. I don't know that I don't like what I'm doing. I do know that I don't like what I'm doing now, but I don't know what I want. And so really coaching them through the process of figuring out what it is they want, what they want life to look like, and then laying the foundation for a life and the way that they spend their time that supports making that vision real. Mm, I love that. Man, you must have some crazy success stories. Is there anything you can share? Like oh my gosh. Like a before, I love before and after. Yeah, it's, it's the best thing ever happened recently. My mom went to a wedding in Baton Rouge and was chatting with a woman. You know, I think somebody said, oh, where, where'd you get that champagne? Oh, it's right over there. Oh, I love your dress. And so they, they strike up a conversation and, you know, oh, who are you? Oh, I'm, I'm Lisa Price. Oh, yeah, that sounds really familiar. Oh, well, I'm Anna Dearman Cornick's mom. And the woman turned to the person next to her and said, Andre, this is Anna Kordick's mom. 
Andre was one of my first time management coaching clients within the first year of, of coaching. Andre ran over to my mom and said, Anna changed my life. Your daughter changed my life. When I first started working with Andre, she was unhappy in her job. She was working 24 seven. She felt like she had to always be on and she didn't have the time to take care of herself. She wasn't following her interests. She didn't even really know what her interests were. And so we worked to figure out what is that vision. We, we called it 2025 Andre. And she got so clear on what exactly what she wanted her look like her life to look like in 2025. She loved her work. She owned a home with a fire pit and a patio and worked in an office with a brick wall and a glass glass window. And like she got so specific and she was volunteering in her community and she was going to bar three times a week. And she told my mom. Anna made me write a letter to 2025 Andre and everything is coming true. I bought a house. I have a fire pit. My, my office has a brick wall and a giant glass window. I have goosebumps. She, oh my gosh. She, it was there all along. We just had to, to bring it to the surface and put the pieces in order for her to make it a reality. Wow. And we have this in all of us, right? All capable. Okay, let's just wipe our tears away. <laughs> I hope you're tuning in. <laughs> you're now the poster child for Anna's work. Woo. Um, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. And the reality is this is in all of us. Yeah. It's just, we got to dig, and you know what? We have to face the demon. That's what it is. is we got to mm -hmm. face those stories and the things that we allowed ourselves to believe in to actually break through. Mm -hmm. And now this woman is just like thriving because you guided her, right? It, she did the work. You told her what path to take. Yeah. Ask, ask the questions. It's all about asking the questions. You know, at the heart of it, coaching is about listening and asking thoughtful questions that allow those ideas in your imagination, right? Her vision would not have been possible without that imagination. If she had just stuck with what she, with what she had known, with what her family had expected of her. And this is for all of us with what your family expects, with what society tells us that life has to look like, with what life looks like for in our friends and with our communities. It takes that imagination to really think through, okay, what would I do if I could, if I could create the life of my dreams? What is the life of my dreams? Okay. Now how do we set the goals and build the habits and align my energy and the way that I spend my time in order to make that a, a path that is possible. So in my planner on page 14, I actually have in designing your vision board. So this page mm -hmm. is work. You design your vision board and I actually, um, I'm just going to, you can't see this obviously if you're tuning in, but I have my vision board printed out in this little cheap plastic frame. I look at <laughs> every day. Mm -hmm. because this is a reminder of what I'm working towards. But on this page, I have a note about conditioning. Mm -hmm. And I say conditioning is a set of moral standards that dictate how we live, what we believe, how we raise our kids, and even where we work. These beliefs can be conscious or subconscious, and they are often things that have been passed down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard the expression, she's rolling in her grave? It's because we have either said or did something we know would go against the person who has passed beliefs and oftentimes our ancestors or beliefs like my mom always said oh my mom is rolling in her grave because I put ketchup on the table not in a fancy crystal saucer but the bottle on the table mm -hmm. and so my mom felt guilt because she was raised to put the ketchup in the fancy dish mm -hmm. really it doesn't matter quite frankly who wants the ketchup in the fancy dish anyway <laughs> but those condition the conditioning is mm -hmm. stopping us from really thriving doing the things that we know are right but like all those beliefs the conditions from like generation and ancestors 
some of it is amazing and it's it's something you have to hold on to other things we gotta let go and that's hard yeah yeah okay so tell us this now I love to talk about imposter syndrome part of it I believe in part of it I don't I actually had a woman on this show Tracy Litt she's amazing she doesn't believe in imposter syndrome so mm-hmm. we can go back to that episode I'm not too sure which number it is but I'll put it in the show notes um because she's like anti-imposter syndrome she thinks it was like this marketing thing that was made up and I was like oh maybe maybe not but how does that affect especially the confidence Mm -hmm. in the people that you work with in having better time management skills yeah so so often I find that when people especially women are struggling with time management it's usually a symptom of not having that clear vision that we just talked about And because they don't know what they want, they don't have the confidence to make moves in any specific direction. But what I have found is that by establishing that vision and even going beyond that, and I know you'll you'll definitely agree with this, articulating your core values, understanding who you are and what makes you tick, um, I have every one of my one-on-one clients take a personality assessment and we're able to dive into a 17 page report that walks us through their personality preferences. And so for the first time, so many of these women feel validated because they see, oh wow, this, yes, this is me. This is, this is normal. Oh, this thing about me is a strength. Wow. And they also realize that they're not alone. They're not the only person who is like them or thinks or feels or believes the way that they do. So often I find that imposter syndrome can be a result of almost a lack of, almost a lack of connection in a way with others because you begin to feel like you're alone and because they're, because that connection with others isn't strong, you feel like, well, I'm not good enough or, um, she is further along than I am. When when we have a, a, a tribe, a mastermind group, a tight-knit group of women friends that we can rely on, we, we get that up-close reminder that we're not alone and that everyone struggles with things. But so often we don't share those struggles. But it's it's really digging into them that you realize, oh wow, we're all experiencing some kind of trial or tribulation or obstacle right now that's impacting how we're showing up. But just having proof that others feel, feel those feelings can make you feel less alone. And when you feel less alone, you feel more confident. And the more confidence that you have, the the easier it is to battle imposter syndrome whenever it shows up. Exactly. I find, oh, I've been doing this, a lot of research lately to d- understand the PR space because PR has shifted so much, especially mm-hmm. in the last like three to five years. Um, and in doing that research and understanding the landscape is also coming across different competitors. Mm. And these people that only started three years ago and they were in a $10 million agency, I'm like, how is that possible? Mm-hmm. And then you get shame like, oh, well, why couldn't I be the one that did that? Yeah. Why couldn't I, have I made the decision to do this and work with these people and hire these people? When in reality, it's like, I don't want to run a $10 million a year agency. Mm -hmm. I know what goes into running a million dollar a year agency. And that's a lot too. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's like, why, why do we think this way? Like, why, why are we so ashamed of the fact that we haven't achieved that? Right. Well, it's so funny because two things come to mind here. First, I I remember a friend who was just so down on herself because she kept seeing these people on Instagram running marathons. And she was like, all these people are running marathons and it just makes me feel like a slob. And I was like, do you want to run a marathon? No, I would never run a marathon. Okay, well why tell me like help me understand I just like see your brain like <laughs> why why is this significant to you yeah like you're running two different races here let why, they are running what marathons was what was it with her that what was it she just she was looking at all of these people doing other things and yeah. she didn't have a thing again goes back to vision did not have 
a thing that she was working toward, whether it was a marathon or going to a bar class once a week or starting a blog or whatever, there was no, there was no goal. There was nothing. It was just stagnant. And so everyone became a comparison point. Oh man, that is, oh, we've all been there. That's such a, such a terrible heart wrenching stage. Yeah. And we get those like every now and then too, especially if you're on the other side of it. But yeah, I totally get it. Like I see sometimes these like stay at home moms that have five kids and perfect nails and hair and a cute house. And I'm like, oh, why can't I do that when I look around my house and we have a full time house manager that yeah. picks up after us all the time and the house is still upside down. I'm like, how do they do that? I don't want to be a stay at home mom with five kids. Why? Yeah. It's like, why am I comparing myself to that? We're not even, and not only that, but there's so much that impacts the, what's, what's being shown at the surface that we can't see. It's like an iceberg. You know, I, I've been spending a lot of time for the last year on things like money mindset, financial security, investing in the future. And I am someone who has in the past been very comparison oriented. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, they just bought this nice car. They must have a lot of money or she just quit her job. So he must be doing really well. And instead we don't know what is happening below the surface. We don't know that a close relative maybe passed away and left a large inheritance. We don't know that maybe people are swimming in credit card debt and have no savings for the future and are living month to month in their beautiful home. We don't know that someone's father-in-law gave them a huge seed, you know, nest egg situation, whatever you call it, a huge investment to start their business. We don't know. And so you can only take what's on the surface of these people that we don't know, especially when they're on Instagram, you know, the, the social media celebrities, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. No. And so to even try to compare ourselves when we don't even have close to the whole story, I mean, it's just why, why do it? Our, it's our generation yeah but also too in these moments and what's worked for me and a lot of my my friends is understanding where that shame or where that comparisonitis mm -hmm. comes from it's mm -hmm. like your friend who like was not jealous but was like envious of these people running marathons and she didn't even want to run one right but you figured out it's because she doesn't have that thing to work towards mm -hmm. right so my example which i've said many times on my show is how i want to win a crossfit competition Mm. But I was told that a tall, skinny woman, so I'm six feet tall, can't gain muscle like a five foot tall woman because I have longer muscles. And it's actually physiologically true. It does take a little bit more for a tall person to, to gain muscle. And that's why there's like, if, like, there's like a perfect body composition of the ideal CrossFit athlete, of which I don't, I don't have at all. Mm -hmm. But I always use that as an excuse. <laughs> oh, well, so-and-so said that I would be, probably be better doing yoga and I could be a professional yoga athlete. I don't think that exists. Um, <laughs> so I shouldn't even try to do CrossFit. Well, guess what? The moment I decided, screw them, I'm doing this, I showed up and I came third in a competition. Yeah, yes. Wow. Oh my God, I actually did it and I wanted to do that. So, hey, maybe your friend does eventually want to run a marathon. Who knows? But when Go you for find it. your thing and you just, you're like, this is it. Who cares what other people say? Who cares? Shut them mm -hmm. up. Like I started yeah. doing, I have my drum, my drum sets right next to me here. <laughs> I started playing drums when I was like 38 years old because I wanted to learn something new. I love it. And people are like, well, what are you, what's the purpose of it? What are you going to do with your, your drumming skills? I'm like, I don't know. I just love it. I don't need to have a reason. It's a hobby. Exactly. That's the thing. I think I am, I am all for side gigs. I think they're great great way to you know pursue a passion to get paid for it use the additional money for paying off debt or spending whatever it is but not every single thing <clears throat> but not every single thing that you enjoy has to become a side gig that you do for money you can enjoy drumming for the sake of drumming you can learn how to needlepoint just because it's something to do with your hands while you watch tv you don't have to start a needlepoint blog and start like teaching needlepoint like you can just learn how to do it if you want yeah. so just enjoy life yeah 
Like we need rec we need fun for the sake of having fun. Again, we're going to take it back to creativity and imagination. The most prolific minds of of our current times and throughout history if you look at how they spend their time people like albert einstein people like thomas edison people like i don't know benjamin franklin benjamin franklin they had hobbies outside of their primary pursuit they had hobbies outside of work many uh ceos have um musical musical hobbies where they play a musical instrument just for the sake of playing a musical instrument and pouring themselves into a hobby for the sake of enjoyment, it unlocks just yeah. new levels of creativity and problem solving for us that we wouldn't have otherwise. Again, having a hobby does not have to be a means to an end. It can just be the end, but the benefits to making time for fun, just for recreation are far reaching yeah. beyond just the fun and enjoyment you're having in the moment. The tinkering, it's like the way mm -hmm. I see it is for me, CrossFit and drumming is a form of meditation mm -hmm. because I'm only focused on learning this new set or counting my reps. Yeah. And literally nothing else is going on in my brain. Focusing oh, that's such on a good breath. feeling. <laughs> yeah. And I'm happy and I'm energized and it allows, it like opens up, like learning a new language, for instance, learning an instrument is creating new neural pathways in your brain. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, it is unlocking another level. And then I come back to work or I show up as a parent or a wife and it's just like, I'm refreshed because mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, this has been amazing. I have one last question for you. Sure. When I ask you what it means to be a wild woman, what is that to you? <laughs> oh gosh. When I think of being a wild woman, I think of knowing myself deeply and owning every positive, negative, every amazing part of me, warts and all, and just being unabashedly myself which is just one of the most freeing feelings and you can take that with you anywhere in whatever you do I love it so if people want to find you online Anna where can they go ah, I would love to invite you to tune in to it's about time my podcast about work life and balance with new episodes every Monday and you can also find me over on Instagram. Send me a DM. I would love to chat. Uh, that's one of my biggest time wasters. But you know what? I love it. I love the connection that I have found on Instagram. So come connect with me over there. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Renee. It was my pleasure.